this is the second part of uh, you know my build of this industrial looking headboard and um, this is basically the build process of the headboard and preparing all the wood for it and stuff um, so I needed some thicker pieces and I did um, have to grab one of my slabs to cut up and you can pretty much see there um, how the wood when it dries at the pith there um, and the center or off to the uh, right hand side you can see how it kind of curls up as it dries so you know that's why you want to kind of avoid the pith when you're doing any kind of sawing but um you know these slabs have been drying now for i think uh probably four to five years i'm gonna say and um it's time that you know they're dry enough to be cut up they've been sitting up in the house for the last month also you know just doing some final drying and um i start by cutting them up on my bandsaw there you can see just to get the um the sides of the pieces down so they'll fit on my eight inch joiner so i can start to flatten them and as with any rough cut wood um my joiner will only take a you know won't take a deep pass so um you have to do a couple couple passes on it to get everything perfectly flat and smooth and so um you know this is really the basic starting point of any project as I've shown you before is um, you know starting with one really good flat side and then it's a matter of going over to the planer and um, making the other side perfectly parallel to that flat side and you know that's a pretty easy job and takes a little bit of time and um, one of the good things is uh, I like that digital uh, Wixie gauge that I put on so I actually can you know get my correct number for the thickness with no problem without you know double checking and measuring it um, you just have to be careful that you don't take too thin a cut on it because you'll get a uh, real bad marks from the infeed roller still as long as you stick to about a 25 thousandths cut um, everything will come out okay now and then once you've got two you know perfectly parallel and flat edges here um, just have to go back and uh, hit it on the joiner just to get a uh, another straight edge and a perfect 90 degree you know edge to the ones that ex are there and you know I keep I keep showing this over and over again but basically once you uh, start working with rough cut wood you have to uh, for any project that you do you have to you know start out with these processes just to get yourself a good usable piece um, and it's over to the table saw to slice this up and you can see how this five horsepower saw will go right through this is like two and a half inch thick ash nice and dry and um, that saw cuts it like butter I had to go back to the grizzly blade um, that Freud premier fusion blade is kind of junk so I, I put that twenty dollar grizzly blade back on it and um, that came with the saw and you can see how that just sort of does a really nice job of cutting no burning during the rips or anything so I'm gonna have to look into getting a good um, straight line rip blade in the future but anyhow I just ripped them a little bit over the width required and um, you know to get a perfect edge I'm just gonna stand them up there and just run them through the planer again and just take a couple thousandths off each side on the pass and you know everything will be I'll have a perfect square when I'm done or a rectangle when I'm done here now these are the um, cross pieces for the headboard and in the meantime I've been preparing some uh, three inch stock to uh, for the uprights and here we are doing the final rip down to width and um, Again, you can see this is three inch thick ash that uh, the saw, that five horsepower saw doesn't even slow down. It just goes through it like butter. Um, so nice having a saw with the, uh, you know, enough power to cut stuff like this without having any issues. And you can see that grizzly blade did do a, a real nice job again on that. Yeah, it's funny because my old uh, 10 inch contractor saw just, um, that had a one and a half horsepower motor on it and that really wouldn't even touch anything three inches thick like this it would just stop the saw so you know, this thing's really um, been an enjoyable saw so far and then I got them everything squared up into three inches on the uprights and now it's just time to um, cut the two ends off and you know cut them to the proper length um, originally I was going to taper them some but in the end I decided to leave them square to get a little bit more of an industrial look on them 
and then you know I went back and I started to um, do some of the layout of um, well here I'm doing the layout of the uh, center to center lines on the spindles and I clamped the top and the bottom pieces back to back and just transferred everything with a um, a square across them so that I would um, they'd both be identical when I put it together and I wouldn't have any misalignment problems so um, next thing I did is I made a jig for my drill press to hold everything up I took about a five and a half foot piece of ash and then I took a piece of three by three aluminum angle iron about four feet long and bolted it on there so I had a nice good uh, support for the drill press and uh, there you can see I bought one of those Craig Automax clamps a couple of weeks ago and um, I was having some, actually when I first got the first one, I was having some trouble with it where sometimes it would clamp right, um, put, give you the right pressure on the clamp, and um, other times it would just, you know, without changing any adjustments on it, you'd have to use two hands to squeeze it in. The clamp would actually deform, so I contacted uh, the Craig company, and they actually... Um, determined that there was a problem with that clamp and they sent me out a, um, a replacement one and the replacement one works perfect it's uh it's really a great you know it's a great working clamp now and I really you know I'm using it a lot so real nice to have something that you can get the correct pressure on when you're just squeezing it with one hand and you can see how that you know that extension table that I made up for the drill press actually really helps when you're trying to um, do stuff like this I put like a pencil mark on that uh, front guide there you can see that is perfectly in line with the center of the drill bit and that way I can just index things and um, you know I'm already aligned perfectly and you're ready to drill the next hole now these holes I'm drilling here are in the bottom of the top rail and they're actually blind holes that are going to be tapped with that one inch beel um, threading tap in the end and there you can see how easy it is to, you know, line everything up and index it and, you know, just keep on going, drilling all the holes. And having the correct, you know, good work and work support really helps to drill holes like this. Um, then once the holes are in place, I had to go back and put a, um, a nice countersink on them uh, just so that the tap would start with no problems. Um, no tear out or anything so you know here it is I got everything all drilled now and I'm just gonna go back and tap the holes and what I had to do seeing how I um, had blind holes here I had to drive the tap in as far as I could and I I first went through and tapped all the holes with the guide on the bottom of the tap and then once I got the um, you know I did that I, I went back and I had to remove the little guide there it is right there off the front of the tap so I can now make it a bottoming tap and go in and clean the holes up pretty much all the way to the bottom so it's a you know it was a two-step process to get the threads deep enough but it didn't really take long and you really need that guide on it in the beginning to make sure everything is straight when you start out so you know there it is I pretty much got everything tapped and just started to you know rough assemble some of the uh, the spindles in there and then I had to go back through and drill the bottom um, originally I was going to uh, drill all the way through the bottom and put a, a nut on the top and the bottom of it but I decided to save a little bit of dowels and uh, save some money on the actual dowels that are threaded I just uh, drill a pocket to a depth like you see here and then what I did is I went back and, um, you know, I had these top holes drilled one inch so that they were just a nice slip fit for the uh, threaded rods. And then I went back and I flipped it around and I drilled a half inch counter bore from the bottom that would allow me to put a screw up through it. And, uh, you know, there it is drilling the counter bores. And then I just drilled a small 3 16 clearance hole through. And I actually used screws up from the bottom just to um, hold the uh, bottom of the the threaded rod there from you know pulling out or loosening up or anything kind of cheating but it worked so there it is just kind of you know everything set together so I can get some final measurements to um, 
to start figuring out how I'm going to uh, mortise and tenion the sides in. So the, you know, one thing I had to do is just set up the table saw with the dado jig on it, or the dado set, I mean, and um, go back through and start to cut the tenon on the end of the um, the two horizontal, the top and the bottom horizontal pieces there. So I, you know, I basically just used the same dimension all the way around it. Um, and I went back and I adjusted the size of the uh, mortise on the side pieces um, to match. So it made it easier, so I just had to do one setup. So, and, you know, here you can see I just took my time and, you know, went, went right around it. And uh, that'll give me a little shoulder for everything to to help uh, glue everything together and hold everything together in the end and you know having a good dado set like that uh, infinity dado datanator or whatever they call a set that I purchased last year really does make a difference because you get really nice clean edges and clean cuts and no tear out or anything so it makes you know this kind of simple joinery really a joy to do so you know there's what they look like um, I did the both ends of each of the pieces there and now it's time to go back and start to lay out the um, the tendons and that was you know a couple measurements later and then I just took and I actually uh, measured the width of the tendons and then I just centered it in the upright post as you can see there and you just you know you have to accurately lay these out because these are the lines that um, I'm gonna be cutting according to so you know if they're not laid out accurately you'll either have a uh, sloppy joints or too tight a joint and I got this mortising attachment for my drill press and I decided um, only to use the top bit holder and I'm going to use the um, that support guide that I made to hold up the uh, and locate the rest of it so you know here you can see it's got the uh, mortising bit in drill press and the drill actually turns within a, um, a square chisel with four sharp corners and it gives you a nice square hole as you drill so you know it just it takes a little while to do these um, really got to hold it down when you're you don't have the other clamp on the drill press but you know it is doable and you just uh, I just start in one corner and then I'll take the uh, bit index it a little bit and you know, just work my way po across the um, one side of the actual mortise that I'm cutting. And then I just take and I, um, I did all the one side on the two pieces, the four joints. And then I went back and I just flipped the, um, flipped the pieces around and used the same setup and everything. And just started working my way uh, backwards across the, um, the other side. And you can see you just got to index it a little bit and then it's got to be clamped really good otherwise you just won't be able to back the chisel out. So you index it a little bit and make another cut and then I just shifted everything over so I could go back through and um, you know just whittle away at the center part of it there and um, eventually I'll have my you know the pocket complete. And, you know, if you're careful and you keep indexing, right, you come out with a, um, you know, real nice mortise there and you just have to take a chisel and just, um, just clean it up just a little bit. Take a razor sharp chisel and just, you know, slice it out. And, you know, there's kind of what the, um, how everything fit together. I just did a, a test fit on it to make sure, you know, everything looked like it was going to line up and go together. So that's the, um beginning of it and you know one thing is this uh, blade cabinet that I made a while back really does help to um, protect the blades and you know it's really a worthwhile project um, if you get if you you know do have any kind of blades and you want to protect them then uh, you know I went back and I decided to put some chamfers um, Maybe for an industrial look, I stick with the um, 45s on everything instead of doing any radiuses or anything like that. I'm just trying to keep it real simple, so um, I just put a, a chamfering bit in the in the little router there and went around everything. 
Another trick that I use for sanding flat surfaces, like when I'm removing those pencil marks that I had laid out on everything and stuff, is just take a piece of um, half, I've got some half sheet self-adhesive sandpaper that I'll just um, stick to a nice flat block of wood and that makes a real good sanding block. And then you can throw it away when you're done with it. I did the same thing on, you know, basically all the parts. I just set up, chamfered it. And then the um, uprights, I decided to do a matching chamfer on them. And this is where you got to really be careful. Um, you can't have a guard on the saw or anything. You get these little cutoffs that you've got to watch out that um, you've got to try to push them past the blade and hope that they don't come flying back at you. So you got to be real careful uh, with them because you can... Uh, I've seen them where they catch a blade and they go flying across the shop. So, And there's no really easy way to protect from them unless you just push them right off the end, which probably I should have done. So there it is. I just, you know, I had to take two posts and just uh, put the chamfers on them. And basically, uh, you know, that that's about the end of it. Now, I wanted to, um, my wife and I decided to put a, a little nameplate in the middle of it saying sweet dreams and I picked a font that I thought was um, kind of like an industrial looking font also to do that and laid that out on my um, to be cut on my CNC router now I've had a lot of people complain when they see me um, you know start using the CNC router in a project but all I can say is this makes it easy for me and it's, it's kind of fun for me and you know it's a whole new learning process but something like this you could actually easily carve in there you could do it with a router freehand you could um, stencil something on I mean there's multiple ways that you can you can add text to a piece like this and you know, I, I just don't see why people stop watching the videos because they see a CNC router being used now it did take a while because you can see there I'm just using a, um, a little one eighth of an inch diameter milling cutter to, to cut this out because I wanted to try to get the smaller tight corners and stuff like that so um, and I'm only taking about a 60 thousandths deep cut by you know 60 thousandths uh, width so it does take a while to, to hot something like this out but you know you really just have to sit there and watch it as it um, appears you know, and as you'll see in a little while I um, actually only made this sign be one half the thickness of the uh, total thickness of, that the piece will be in the end um, just because it was easier for me to fabricate everything that way so um, you know here you can see it does come out real nice and um, I think it's kind of fun to watch it working And you can also see there that I did start with a uh, slightly oversized block of wood there just so that I could go back and trim it to the exact size that I wanted when everything was done. And there's those clamps that I made up for the router. I did the video about a while ago and they really do hold everything good and they're, you know, real simple to engage and remove. Um, and then I just uh, used some stencil ink to go back and fill in the collars on the letters um, seems to be the easiest stuff and the best stuff that um, I found to use for this it you know it goes on nice it covers really well and it um, basically dries in no time at all and then it's really easy to go back and just clean up with the joiner so what I do is um, right now I've got the joiner set just for to take off maybe even less than a 64th of an inch a super thin cut um, and I do a really slow feed on it just so that I don't rip the centers of the letters and stuff out. Um, because if you take too deep a cut and feed too fast, you can actually uh, tear them up really good, I found out. So all I do is I'll do a couple of really, you know, really light passes over just to um, preserve what I can of the lettering. So there you can see I did one pass and there's still a little bit of the um, stain in the wood so I'm just going to do one more one more thin pass and you know that'll clean it up real good and um, you'll be all ready to go on to the next step. 
And there it is, all cleaned up, ready to go. So now it's, um, you can see this is where I'm going to add the uh, second piece of wood to make it thicker. And um, what I'm doing now is instead of trying to drill all the holes for the um, those threaded rods to go through, what I decided to do is just mark out some areas there where I'm going to cut, just take the dado head and I'm going to cut dados out. Um, a little bit oversized for the rods just so everything will fit together easy and um, the nuts actually cover up everything so you know you won't even know that they're not holes and it's really the easiest way for me to get this done. Um, I kind of have trouble sometimes trying to get perfectly straight drilled holes and you know when you're dealing with that size of hole and stuff and got to get a bunch of things lined up so the dados works for me. So, you know, there it is, front and the back piece, how they're going to go together around the dowels. And now it's just time to glue everything together. And, you know, as always, I like to use this tight bond glue for anything that I glue up or do. It seems to um, stand up good. I've never had a problem with it. So I just put a, a layer on everything and then take one of those little silicone brushes and just go back and smooth it out. Now for these two pieces I'm just going to put glue on one side because there's you know there's really no structure or anything no structural strength needed or anything it just has to hold it together so kind of try to get everything lined up as good as I can and like to use a couple of spring clamps to to hold it while I'm still fiddling with it because um, you know things can slide around pretty good if you don't get something to hold it when you're um, going back to put on the uh, the screw clamps. So there it is, uh, all kind of all clamped together and just you know let that sit for a half hour and dry and um, now it's time to start doing the final assembly here and I had to thread the nuts onto the um, each of these rods um, and I've got one inch sticking down up into the top there like that so I just uh, threaded them in and then used that wrench that I 3D printed to get the alignment on them perfect. And kind of, you know, started setting them in place like that. And then I determined the um, the correct height of the nuts for the middle to, to center that sweet dream sign and figured that all out. And then I went back and did the final trimming up on that and um, the final chamfering around the outside of it. You know, again, using that little DeWalt router. It's a real handy little router to have. You know, the best part is, unlike that little Harbor Freight trim router, it can swing, this can swing a pretty big bit. And um, you can adjust the speed so on certain woods like this ash, you don't get burning um, when you you slow down for corners and stuff like that. So it's a real handy thing to have. So I got the... Um, there you see pretty much got the, the nut set in and went back and uh, got the sweet dream centered on there and then there's another set of nuts coming up from the bottom there and you know they were all installed and then went back and set up the uh, dimension on the final nuts to hold the um, bottom on and then just kind of slipped everything together um, had to fiddle a little bit because you know everything wasn't perfectly straight but um, you know I just had to shake a little bit and it went together and there you can see that's how it's going to go into the sides then I went back and um, on the uprights I decided to drill a hole and thread the uprights um, at first I was going to put a um, a bolt all the way in from the outside to the uh, through the tenon but I found out that you can't tap the end grain with that wood tap so I decided to glue them together and then um, this here I'm just tapping this so I can go back later and I'm gonna make some bolts and actually screw some lights onto the side of the headboard that are kind of matching light so you know I got those all tapped in and then it's time to go back and start doing the final assembly and I just took some, you know, some more of that type on glue and I spread it in all the um, mortises here and used the brush to spread it around. And then I took and, um, you know, went back and I spread some on the tenons and got everything all ready to go together. And then just got it lined up and, you know, kind of 
had to force it a little bit. So many pieces going together here. And then once I got that all started, um, you know, it wasn't, it was pretty easy to go back to and just, uh, put, I used two clamps on it to hold everything together. Yeah, that's a good thing about using pipe clamps. I mean, you can make them as long as you want. You can get pieces of pipe. Uh, I know Home Depot, you can get it 10 feet long. And in a plumbing supply place, you can get 20 foot sections. So um, pipe clamps are good when it comes to something like this. And you know, just go back and double check everything for square. And you can see those holes from the bottom. I actually put Craig screws up from the bottom to um, to hold the uh, the bottom of the dowels from moving. So now it's, um, you know, doing a little bit of sanding on it while I'm waiting for the glue to dry. And then I wanted a um, board across the bottom just to keep pillows and stuff from sliding out. So I just took a piece of walnut and I decided to um, just use some Craig screws to hold that in place. Trying to keep, you know, everything as simple as possible and no fancy joinery or anything on this. So Craig screws are really um, great when it comes to you know mounting a couple pieces edge to edge like this and stuff and uh you know once you got the jig it's real easy to put them in you just set the jig up properly um drill the holes and just have to sand a little bit on the uh, edges of them to get a the little bit of fuzz where the drill tears out you know before you put everything together and um i used inch and a half screws on this one and got my pieces clamped in place exactly where they were going to go before I, you know, put the screws in and then it's just a matter of um, using a drill driver and driving them in until they're snug. Um, I like to just feather it a little bit because uh, if you're not careful, you can actually drive them in and strip them out if you put too much torque on the drill and this drill doesn't have a torque limiter on it, so this driver actually, so um just got to feather a little bit, play with it until you see everything pull nice and tight together. And I think that uh, that Craig jig and, uh, you know, these Craig screws were probably one of the best things ever invented for woodworking. And then there you can see where I put those taps in the side there to screw the lights on later. And now what I'm going to do is just make up some short bolts using the... Um, the stock that I threaded and, um, you know, some of the nuts that I had made in the first video. So they're just going to screw in there and hold the lights in place. So, you know, same thing. I cut the, the pieces of the threaded rod to the right length and sanded a little chamfer on the bottom of them before I started so the thread would start easy. And then just spread some glue in the area to thread and um, took them in, just screwed them into the uh, nuts until they were flush. And you can see that countersink is on the is there in the nut. So um, I got to go back later and trim them to get rid of all that. But um, you know this was really easy to to make them this way. And, and I just set up a uh, a threaded piece in my jig there and just tighten the um, the bolt in there using that little wrench. Real handy wrench to have. And then I just went back and uh, cleaned all four of them off. Just to the point where that chamfer was gone, so you know, with a nice flat top on them. And I just went back over to the lathe and you know, chucked them in the three draw chuck there. And um, instead of getting fancy, I just took a piece of sandpaper and went back and put that uh, that slight chamfer and a um, little bit of radius on them with the sandpaper, and then just sanded them flush. And, uh, you know, basically once these nuts were done, I went back over and I just uh, started sanding everything to remove all my pencil lines and just to do all the final sanding on everything. So, you know, everything was pretty much cleaned up and um, sanded and ready to be finished. And um, that's when things started going bad. So I decided I was going to try to use some uh, brush-on water-based polyurethane on it and... I did not realize that when you brush the polyurethane and you go around edges and corners and whatnot that it actually makes like a white foam that does not turn clear. It's not like the um, oil-based poly where that'll turn clear later if you get any little bubbles. These bubbles dry white and fuzzy and they just look terrible. So um, basically I went through and I brushed it all on and I... Um, 
you know, try to get everything. You can see it's real tough to get in there. And every time you go around an edge or get down in the thread, you do make a little bit of that white foamy stuff in the polyurethane. And I was under the assumption that it was going to dry clear, but um, it didn't. So when I got all done, um, I got everything polyurethaned and I let it dry. And then I looked at it and I'm like, oh, what a mess. So now what I'm doing is I'm going back through, I'm sanding off all that polyurethane, I'm trying to scrape all the, um, that white stuff that built up on the edges off and trying to clean everything up. And, you know, I'm using this water-based poly because my wife has a chemical sensitivity syndrome and she can't put up with any of the smells of any of the VOCs from the oil-based stuff. So I've been trying to use this water-based and it's just, just not right I'm um, having nothing but problems and here you can see it turned into an extra day and a half's worth of work going back through um, sanding all that off um, anywhere little white bubbles built up in the threads or anything else they all had to be scraped out and um, you know it just it just turned into a uh, quite a lot of extra work just because I um, you know I didn't know much about using this water-based poly so basically, instead of being finished with this um, headboard and this video and everything, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop it here and um, I'll pick it up again once I figure out exactly what I'm going to do to get a good finish on this. And, you know, once I get everything all cleaned up and, um, you know, come up with a, a better idea for finishing it. Uh, originally, I wasn't going to show you this part of the video because it's, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to, to see, but um, I figured I, I might as well just add it in there just to show you, you know, what possibly can go wrong and um, the extra work you can create yourself um, when you get to the final finishing step if you don't know what you're doing. I'm just going to, you know, leave this here for now and um, I'll make another video shortly of the final finish. Anyhow, I did get my first uh, couple big salads of the year out of that lettuce that I started back a little while ago. I did the thinnings of it, and really en we enjoyed a couple salads, nice tender young salads. And um, so there you can see it pretty much the, um, you know, this was the build of the, the headboard. And, um, you know, I'll do one more video on it just to finish up the finishing and, um, you know, just kind of installing it. And hopefully I'll get to the lights that go along with it too. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe.